continue. So the second talk of the session is given by Wilfred Salmon, and, and the topic is advantage in quantum pack learning. So please. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organizers. Um, so as Alex said, I'm going to be talking about uh, advantages in quantum pack learning, and this is work done in collaboration with Sergey Strelchik and Tom Gurr uh, at the University of Cambridge. And here's a link to the uh, archive um, where most of this work is. So brief outline of the talk, we're going to start with a review of classical uh, pack learning, which gives us the necessary background to then introduce quantum pack learning and very, very briefly touch on some of the advantages that already exist in the pack learning literature, but it's by no means an exhaustive list of those advantages. Um, then we're going to introduce our new access model for quantum pack learning, uh, talk about our main result, which is a generic advantage for pack learning. Uh, and then I'll briefly give you the key idea in, in how we get our result, And conclude with some open problems um, that uh, I think are worth looking into. Okay, so we'll start with uh, classical pack learning, which is sort of the fundamental basis uh, for most of modern machine learning. And it relies on two key assumptions. Uh, first of all, that uh, a good model doesn't have to be exact. It's enough to be correct with very high probability. And also your learning algorithm doesn't always have to output something that's correct. It's also enough for that to happen with high probability. If 99% of the time you output something that is correct 99% of the time, that's probably good enough in practice. Um, of course, this is a huge theory, uh, so we don't have time to go through all of the different types. So we're just gonna focus on the, the most uh, studied type of pack learning object, which is called a classifier. Um, which is just an indicator function on some finite sets. I mean, you can deal with infinite sets as well, but then you have to do measure theory. And I don't like measure theory, so we're going to do finite sets. Um, and a classifier is just a, a zero one function on that set. Sometimes it's also thought as a subset where you think of uh, the pre image of the number one as being some subset which is marked as yes. So, for example, you might have uh, X be the set of images, and F might output one on pictures of salmons and zeros on other pictures. So this would be a one, and this would be a zero. OK. Um, now, in most scenarios, uh, not all inputs to your uh, function are equal. You care about some a lot more than others. So for example, if that, that previous example I was talking about, you probably care about what your neural network or, or, or algorithm says on images like this, you probably don't care what it says on some random pixelated noise. And you're far more likely to get inputs to your algorithm that look like this than you are random pixelated nonsense. So this is modeled by some probability distribution on the underlying set, but it's very hard to write down what that probability distribution would be or even get a handle on what it would look like. So generally, we assume that this distribution is unknown and we want our learning algorithm to work whatever the distribution is, but we just assume that there's some distribution out there. The moment you have a distribution on your set, uh, that induces a distance between two classifiers, which is just the probability that they disagree if you draw a sample according to the underlying distribution. Um, finally, if we had no information about what our function is, uh, the function that we're trying to learn, that would be an extremely uh, difficult problem because there's doubly exponentially many possible classifiers. So to even describe a generic classifier takes exponential information. Um, so, for example, in, in the case of these, the, the pictures example I was talking about, we know that whether or not a picture contains a certain animal is a rotationally symmetric property. So we know that our function should be rotationally symmetric. Um, and the most general way that you can tell someone some structure is you can promise that uh, the function belongs to some uh, subset of possible classifiers. And this subset is usually called a concept class, and elements of C are called concepts which is basically just another word for classifier, and I'll probably use them interchangeably. So to recap, we've got some unknown uh, concepts in our concept class that we're trying to learn. Um, a learning algorithm is going to receive some random data that depends uh, on the, the unknown concept. And there's like a whole plethora of different access models that are, that are um, considered in the classical learning community. but the one that started it all, and the most famous one is random labeled examples, which is going to re we're going to receive pairs of data points, x, c of x, where x is drawn according to this unknown distribution, and we get told the label of that point x. 
the algorithm uh, succeeds if it outputs a hypothesis H with error at most epsilon, so it gets something that's epsilon close. Um, and because the uh, algorithm is just receiving random data, the output of the algorithm is a random variable is it's in of itself. And we want to uh, we want that algorithm to succeed with probability at least one minus delta. Um, I probably should have said PAC stands for probably approximately correct learning. And that P probably is that with probability at least one minus delta. And the AC approximately correct is that your output is a correct most of the time. So to summarize, an algorithm is an epsilon delta learner. If with uh, probability uh, one minus delta, it outputs something that is uh, wrong with probability less than or equal to epsilon. Uh, and we want it to work for any underlying concept and any distribution. So as mentioned in the previous talk, uh, the sample complexity, so the number of samples that um, uh, the algorithm needs to draw um, was, was, well, I should say that the, the sample complexity of a concept class is just the, the, the best possible learning algorithm. And that sample complexity was uh, sort of pretty well described back in 1989 in this very seminal paper, which found it was, uh, found this expression where I've defined epsilon and, and delta, but I haven't told you what D is. D is uh, called the VC or vapnik Japernicus dimension of the concept class. And it's a combinatorial parameter. So you can just look at the concept class uh, C and in theory, read off what D is. Uh, it's a bit finicky, the definition, so I won't go into it, but it basically tells you how much structure there is in, that, in your concept class. So if your concept class is extremely structured, it has a low VC dimension and therefore a low sample complexity. And if it's got not much structure at all, then the, the um, uh, dimension is very, very high and you need lots of samples to learn. Now, of course, um, oh, and yeah, the lower bounds from that uh, paper. And then they also provided an upper bound, which was a log epsilon factor worse. But it actually took like 27 years to get rid of that log factor in, in 2016 by, by Hanukkah. Um, this is, of course, all in sample complexity. Time complexity is probably a more realistic resource because you care how long your algorithm runs for, but it's extremely hard to prove lower bounds in time complexity. So we use sample complexity as a proxy to get some kind of handle on how these algorithms are going to scale. Um, so on to quantum pack learning, and we'll have a slide about the good things in quantum pack learning. Um, in 1995, uh, two people, Bashuti and Jackson, introduced a generalization of, of pack learning to the quantum case. Um, and instead of receiving uh, these pairs, you receive this quantum state, which is chosen specifically so that if you measure uh, the quantum state in the computational basis, you get back a classical random labeled example. And therefore, quantum algorithms can't be worse in sample or time complexity because you can always just measure all your copies of the states and then run your classical learning algorithm. But they could be better. And in fact, if you restrict D to being the uniform distribution, then we know that there are lots of cases where you can get quantum speed ups and those are provable in sample complexity. So I've written down some examples of so DNF formulae, K hunters, you can recast Bernstein Vazirani in this context as well. Um, and you can even get exponential time complexity advantages, but these tend to be a little bit pathological and rely on things like factorization being easy for quantum computers, but hard for classical computers. And that's in time rather than sample complexity. Unfortunately, some bad news, um, which is if you go to the full model where you allow arbitrary distributions, in 2017, Arun and Chalam and DeWolf uh, showed that you actually can't get generic sample complexity uh, advantages. So they showed that quantum pack learners must draw at least this many samples, which matches the classical upper bound. And therefore, you can only hope for advantages in prefactor or for time complexity advantages, but no generic information theoretic advantages. Um, so this is where we introduce our different access model and spoilers, we will find that there's advantage in our access model. Um, we assume that you have access to a unit tree that prepares the quantum sample rather than just the sample itself. So there's some fixed input state, which is probably cat zero tends to itself a bunch of times, but in general, it's just some state that you know how to prepare. And you have a unit tree that when you act on that input state gives you the quantum sample. Um, more generally, we can cope with a unit tree that adds some random phase and some random uh, uh, state uh, garbage that we don't care about, which is quite important because often it's easy to prepare states with garbage, but quite hard to get rid of that garbage. And very importantly, we also assume you have access to the inverse of the unit tree. 
And in our model, a query is equal to the oracle or its inverse, which is supposed to be roughly equivalent to the difficulty of preparing one of these quantum samples. So our main result is that in our work, uh, sorry, with our, with our access model, uh, we get an upper bound that looks like this, which if you stare enough, stare out hard enough and you've got a good memory, you might notice that one over epsilon has turned into one over square root epsilon. So we've got a square root advantage in sample complexity. And we get a lower bound that looks like d over square root epsilon. So up to this log bit that we most people don't really care about, uh, the, the, the bounds match. And the only possible advantage you can get is a square root in the epsilon parameter. So importantly, there's no possible advantage in VC dimension. And yeah, this is learning classical data encoded in quantum systems. So now that I've said that our model lets you get a, a square root advantage, that's a reason that it, it's, it's a good model, but is it actually reasonable? Um, if you, on the one hand, if you can produce the quantum state, you are probably doing it by some unitary process. It's very unlikely that these states popped out of nowhere. You probably created them with a black box process. And if that black box process was a circuit of one and two qubit gates, then it's probably easy to invert it because you just swap the order of the gates and replace each by their inverse. Of course, you know, telling an experimentalist, oh, just run your experiment backwards, may not, they may not be such a fan of, but theoretically, at least, it's easy to do the opposite. Um, I would say it's unclear whether quantum machine learning of, of just classical data is actually going to be useful ever because of this problem that loading unstructured data into quantum computers probably takes exponential time. Um, there's a stronger case to be made, I think, for when you're trying to learn um, classical data about inherently quantum systems. So for example, if you've got a spin system and you're trying to learn correlations between spins at very distant sites, that's classical data, you know, the correlation between two points, but it comes from an inherently quantum system. And in that case, maybe you have an oracle that corresponds to something like Hamiltonian simulation of, of, your, of your state and your data is inherently quantum and you have the unitary in its inverse. So there are cases where I think it is conceivable that this access model could be reasonable. And I don't think in, there are many cases where it's reasonable to ex assume that you have access to these states, but not the unitary in their inverse. And finally, just as a kind of, we're not the only ones that are doing it. Uh, other people are looking at this access model too in various different contexts. So for example, to just name a few, state tomography, channel tomography, and uh, mean estimation. So that's estimating the mean of a, of a classical random variable. All have recent works where you assume access to the unitary, the inverse of the unitary, and often also the controlled version of the unitary as well. We don't need the controlled version though. So I promised you the key idea for our proof. So that there's gonna be two slides on that. And one of the slides is gonna be introducing this seemingly unrelated uh, classical machine learning technique called equivalence queries. And then on the next slide, I'll explain how that ties into our work. So uh, an equivalence query is, is an alternative access model for classical pack learning. And instead of receiving this random labeled example, you get to submit what you think the uh, underlying function is to the Oracle. And the Oracle either says, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, the, the, the thing that you submit doesn't actually have to be in the concept class, it's just some classifier. And if you uh, get the right answer, the Oracle just says yes, and you can stop your learning algorithm because you have the right answer. And otherwise, you're told, here's a place where you're wrong. So you get given an X, C of X, importantly, where it's different from your guess. And you can study this in the adversarial setting where the, the Oracle gets to pick this, this counterexample to be as you know, little as helpful as possible. But we're going to talk about it in the random setting where the, the, the counterexample is basically distributed according to the underlying distribution, but conditioned on being a counterexample. So if X is a, if X is a counterexample, its probability is just the distribution renormalized by the probability that you're wrong. And if it's not a counterexample, then its probability is zero. Um, it turns out that this model uh, is significantly strong, exponentially faster uh, at learning than, than random labeled examples. So in this, in this paper from 2021, uh, these two authors, uh, Klusch and Urbanka, show that you can get uh, a, a speed up where the, the um, D and delta de dependence is the same, but the one over epsilon has turned into a log to the power of nine, one over epsilon. Um, and they conjecture that this log to the power of nine can actually be made as small as log one over epsilon, but in their proof, they end up with a log to the power of nine. Um, why, why do we care about equivalence queries? Well, classically, you can simulate an equivalence query with random labeled examples by just repeatedly drawing, you know, you have your idea of what the hypothesis is, and you repeatedly draw random labeled examples until you find one that is a counterexample. So you just do rejection sampling, and that will have the correct distribution, 
And you need to do that about one over epsilon times to either conclude, yes, I'm with an epsilon of the underlying hypothesis and I can just stop and say what I currently have is good, or uh, I find a counterexample and I can proceed with my algorithm. But with a quantum computer using a Grover search-like technique or amplitude amplification, you can actually do that in square uh, one over square epsilon time. So you get this square root advantage in the amount of time because you can just search for places that you're wrong. Um, so if you multiply that time or number of samples to do an equivalence query by the equivalence query learning complexity, you end up with this, which is exactly the upper bound from our work. I held a, I, I hit a log to the power of nine earlier. Um, and importantly, if you manage to improve the sample complexity uh, of the equivalence query learning algorithm, then our algorithm will improve as well immediately. Um, and okay, there are some technical details that I'm kind of brushing under the rug here because obviously all of this is probabilistic, but uh, that's morally the main idea of our algorithm. So I'll just conclude with some open problems. Um, I think the most interesting uh, open problem is what if you don't have the inverse of the oracle? What if you just have the unitary that prepares the state? Does that reduce you to the power of just the copies of the state, or is it still the same as the full power of the universe and the inventory? Uh, sorry, the, the unitary and the inverse, or does it depend on the concept class, or does it depend on the particular implementation of the oracle, etc.? Um, is there a classical equivalent to the inverse of the oracle? Because we've given our quantum computing model more power, but it's unclear what we should give the classical um, learner as a as a um, equivalent uh, new power. Uh, can you generalize this to agnostic learning? The answer is probably yes, using mean estimation stuff, but that's a more um, realistic model of machine learning, so it would be nice to get similar speed ups there. Can we get rid of some log 1 over epsilon factors? Um, if the equivalence query people get rid of some log 1 over epsilon factors, that, that you can also immediately carry that through to our algorithm. But if you want to get rid of log 1 over epsilon factors altogether, it's going to require a new idea because... Um, if you use just our approach and you want to get a one over square epsilon, then you would need the equivalence query learning algorithm to have no dependence on epsilon at all. And that seems quite unrealistic. So removing all log one over epsilon factors probably requires a new idea. Um, can we translate some of these information theoretic sample complexity advantages into some more concrete models of machine learning and maybe some time complexity advantages instead? Uh, and yeah, thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you for, for interesting talk. Any questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, could you talk about the lower bound proof at all? Um, yeah, the lower bound comes, uh, do you know what the VC dimension is? Yeah. Okay. So you basically, you take a set um, on which, uh, which is shattered. So you're, uh, and you restrict the distribution to that set so that you um, have no information about, uh, there's no structure on the learning problem basically. Uh, and then that just basically reduces to learning a bit string. Um, then you put the district, sorry, you set the distribution to be basically all of the weight on one element and then uh, a very small amount of weight on the other elements, but enough that you need to learn a bunch of them. So it's the classic uh, lower bound distribution. And then you can show that that the problem is equivalent to learning a bit string and that there are existing lower bounds for recovering a bit string with a weak phase oracle. And we show that you can turn a weak phase oracle into a oracle that uh, prepares, our, um, prepares that distribution. Um, and therefore we reduce to recovering a bit string with a weak phase oracle which is actually in the, the, the exact thing we reduced to as a result from the, the, the state tomography paper from von Appeldorn et al., um, which is actually just a footnote where they don't give a proof, but they say you could prove this by doing three things. So if those three things do work, then that's what we reduced to. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, more questions, please? Can you... Can you imagine any natural setting where the complexity would be sublinear in the VC dimension? Um, so in, there are some cases of um, in boosting algorithms, which is where you have a, like a bad machine learning algorithm and you run it many, many times and want to produce a good um, sample, where there's some existing work by Aruna Chalam and uh, DeWolf, Izbeki, Mighty, 
that uh, show some sublinear, so square root VC dimension um, improvements. But because we have this lower bound, you, you, we know that we can't get those sorts of square root improvements in, in this setting. Thank you. No questions? Okay, let's see. So uh, I have a question. I guess it was your first open problem was uh, you need, uh, what happens if you reduce your ability to queries in your circle? Uh, yeah, so my question is, um, do you know of any problem where this gives any improvement? So not necessarily, necessarily machine learning, but something else. Yeah, so for example, in quantum metrology, um, if you are given, so the very, very, the simplest example in what quantum metrology is, is an unknown phase. So one over square root two, zero plus e to the i theta one. And if you're just given copies of that state, there's no quantum advantage. But if you're given a unitary one, zero, zero e to the i theta, then you get a quadratic improvement. And you don't need the inverse of the unitary. In fact, the inverse is useless. You just need the unitary itself. Um, and you already get the, the quadratic improvement. So there are some settings in quantum information, at least, where the unitary is sufficient. Uh, I don't know of any really quantum computing examples of where someone studied just the unitary but not the inverse and got an improvement. If anyone does have any examples, I would like to know. So please let me know. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's trivial to understand where the complexity is going to end up. Okay, thank you. That was interesting. So any one final question? Okay, if no more questions, let's... Question. Oh, is, sorry. Thanks for your talk. So is there any relation between having access to the Oracle and the inverse and classical membership queries? Um, I don't think so. Because so membership queries are when you can just query a, a label uh, like an X and just get back what C of X is. So, for example, if the distribution has no weight on an element, um, then it's impossible using the oracle and the inverse of the oracle to find out what the the concept class is on that element. But with a membership query, you can obviously do that. So, I think membership queries are kind of I wouldn't say they're strictly stronger, but they're sort of incomparable because there are some things that you can do with membership queries that. You know, if the, if the weight of the distribution is very, very small, I think with the just the states, it requires one over the distribution number of samples to, to get the value of that element. With this, you can probably turn that into a one over square root thing with a Grover, but I don't think you can do better than that. So membership queries give you a lot more than the Oracle and the inverse. Thanks. Okay, thanks Thank you. Very nice talk. So uh, you had a, like a last point about quantum neural networks, maybe or something. Yeah. Yes. So uh, in classical neural networks, this VC dimension is actually not useful because it provides vacuous bounds. And people have thought about other kinds of, you know, complexity uh, uh, dimensions like a path norm and so on. Do you know if someone has, has looked at uh, more useful um, ways to characterize the uh, concept class of quantum neural networks? Um, I would guess that someone has probably done it, but I do not know uh, exactly. I, I don't really know much of the theory of like practical, practical quantum machine learning. Um, so yeah, sorry, I don't know, but I would be shocked if someone hasn't looked at it. More questions? The question, I guess. He's just scratching his head, yeah. <laughs> okay, then uh, let's, thank, uh, let's thank the speaker again and we wrap up.